Thank you. Okay, I have the task of trying to show you the future right now in 20 minutes. That's tough. So, yeah, I gotta get going. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start with just giving you an idea of NASA and JPL where we started, and then just show you little snippets of future technologies. So, it'll have some areas of things that we're doing right now, but other stuff that's gonna be 20 or 30 years out in the future. So let's just first start with how JPL got started. JPL started down here in uh, Pasadena at Caltech. And what was going on at that point was a bunch of professors from Caltech and a bunch of students were using things like red fuming nitric acid and other hypergolic stuff, stuff that explodes on contact. And they were doing tests down here in Pasadena. Well, let's just say the administration wasn't that impressed with that, and they said, look, go up into the Arroyo, just, just get away from downtown Pasadena. So they went up into the Arroyo, and they just started building things. You know, I think building one was a shed, building two was a, bi a bigger shed, building three might have been an outhouse. Uh, right now we're past building 350, I think the oldest building is building 11. Well, we, one of the first gigs we did was for the with military, which was putting rockets under the wings of airplanes. Well, when we signed the contract, they said, what do you call yourselves up here? Well, we should have been the Rocket Propulsion Laboratory, but that was viewed as too much like Buck Rogers. So in 1944, when we signed the contract, we said we are the Jet Propulsion Laboratory a Division of Caltech. And we went that way until about 1958, when this happened, NASA was created. Problem was, NASA wanted JPL, but Caltech didn't want to give it up. So the deal that was negotiated was that NASA will pay Caltech to run JPL. So the whole place is government owned, but I'm a Caltech employee. And that's where we are today. So if we look at this place, um, that's where we, what we looked like in 1942, up in the Arroyo. It was just, right, 177 acres. Today we look more like this. We're about one and a half Disneylands in terms of area. We have an operating budget. It varies, but around 1.4, 1.5 billion dollars. Uh, we can argue later whether that's too much or too little. JPL's major area of responsibility is deep space robotic exploration. We define deep space as two million kilometers or about eight Earth moon distances out. But more and more of our funding is involved with Earth studies, so we do about 30% Earth science, so the way we distinguish between what we do and the Goddard Space Flight Center does on the East Coast, we say they do weather, we do climate. We do the long-term evolution of weather. Now, when you're doing spacecraft exploration, you can't just do it here from Pasadena. You have to be able to talk to your spacecraft. So we manage these things. These are the deep space network. These are 70 meters, about 250 feet across, and these are precision devices. We've got a set of them in Goldstone, California, a set near Madrid, Spain, and a set near Canberra, Australia. So basically, as the Earth turns, there's always one antenna complex that can see that part of space. To give you an idea how, how impressive these dishes are, I mean, you're moving a football field. Uh, my Voyager spacecraft that I started with in, wow, 1980, uh, that has a transmitter of 23 watts of power. You take that, and 23 watts is about the light, the power it takes to run the light bulb in your refrigerator. You put that refrigerator out at Neptune, about three billion miles out, the signal strength this thing has to pick up is roughly one billionth of one billionth of one watt. And now we're three times further, well, four times further. So, oh, and it's not, that's not dumb enough. It's got to actually make epicycles to make sure it's always on the strongest signal as it goes across the sky. So let's start. I'm going to start by leaving the Earth. This is an actual movie from a camera that was put on a Delta II looking straight down. So these are the tops of the solid rocket boosters. And what I want to illustrate here is this is not fake, this is not sped up, this is not animated. This is real footage of what it takes to leave the Earth. And it illustrates one of the problems. Rockets are exceedingly expensive and they have to work the first time every time and you can't afford to make things redundant because now you're just spending money on parts that you hope you never use. Um, you know, if you think about it, and, this, and I'm not going to correct for really your dollars, in the Saturn program in the 60s with, with Apollo, that was about a million dollars per pound to orbit. The shuttle was about a hundred thousand dollars per pound. Uh, today's rockets are about 
$10,000 per pound. Elon Musk with SpaceX is starting at $5,000 per pound, and he wants to get to $100 per pound. We're just about to lose the solids. There's a the coast. I will tell you that as this price falls, at one point, you know, Mr. Hilton's going to say, heck with NASA, and they're just going to put a hotel in low orbit. <laughs> Matter of fact, I tell my kids that they're the last generations of human beings to be able to say, quote, I remember looking up at the moon and remembering when there were no city lights on it. <laughs> so, and that's going to happen. So just, let's start uh, moving on from Earth. Uh, I, sh I should say, when this corner gets black, it means you're actually above the atmosphere. And we're just about to go there. So yeah, okay, everybody, we're now in space. <laughs> Doesn't take long, but it's got to work the first time every time. Now, one of the things that we do, starting with the Earth, is we have these network of environmental spacecraft that are just studying the different conditions of the Earth to really understand what's going on. Because before you can make any kind of statement one way or the other, you've got to get data. So an example of the data set, this, this is from the Aquarius spacecraft. You're looking at salt. So there's the Amazon, so blue is fresh water. This is going across the uh, Pacific. Red is high salt, and you're just measuring how salt changes across the ocean. And we do this in the atmosphere, we do this in oceans, we do this uh, land masses, just trying to understand how the system works. Because if we can take the atmospheric data tied into the oceanography data, now we can understand how Earth is working as a system. Now, one of the, this was one of the challenges we had in 2004. George Bush, president of the time, came up with a thing called the Constellation Program to land humans on the moon. In this cartoon, you had the Altair lander, you had the astronauts, their rover, but the habitat module was placed on top. And the question was, how do you get it off? Nobody really thought about a crane to grab this thing and pull it off. So JPL said, hey, we'll work on it, and we've started developing something that has the coolest acronym now. There's no mission associated with it. I want to introduce you to athlete. This is all-terrain, hex-limbed, exoterrestrial explorer. This is about 15 <laughs> feet tall. It's got a hip joint, a knee, an ankle, and wheels. This thing can either drive or walk. This whole thing to get the pallet off, so it's on a pallet. The way this thing would work is you'd have athlete drive up to the Altair lander, split into two three-wheeled vehicles, which we call triathlete. They would stand up, grab the pallet, slide off, and come down again. Now, in a way, this is a lot like a baby in terms of you have to teach it every single thing it does. That's why it takes so long. You'd like to get higher level commands. We sometimes refer to babies as, as that they're born with an operating system, but for your life, you're giving them application software. <laughs> but here, what you do is, if you can take a habitat and put it on the moon or any other surface, and, you know, if you just land on the moon, that's colonization. You put it on wheels and you drive it around, that's exploration. And you can also get other countries to work with us without worrying about technology transfer because you can have other countries just put cash as supplies on different locations of the moon and you just drive to those locations. Um, Mars is the, one of the big places that we really want to go to, even though it's smaller. It's about half the size. The major things about Mars is you've got Valles Marineris, which is a Grand Canyon that would stretch across the United States. So a little dot on this would be our Grand Canyon on Earth. It's got three small shield volcanoes, each one the size of Mount Everest. And the real bad boy is Olympus Mons, which is about three times the height of Mount Everest, and it's got a footprint the size of Arizona. So if you picture that thing going, that'd be really kind of fun. Fortunately, it's dormant. This is an old picture of the uh, Mars Exploration Rover, Opportunity Rover, which is still alive. There's something really cool about this photo that I just love. This is the Victoria Crater. There are the tire tracks, and we're looking back at the crater, photographing our tire tracks. There are three ways to drive a rover. The hardest and safest way is you command all six wheels how many degrees of revolution you want them to go, and you just do waypoints. The next level of sophistication is you let the rover watch what you're doing and it'll decide whether it wants to do it. So if I say, drive off the stage, it'll go, nah, I don't want to do that. It'll just stop. <laughs> the most sophisticated way of driving a rover, and it's also the riskiest, 
is this, and this is the first what we call autonomous drive, where you say, Rover, leave the building, and it'll just try to figure out how to do it on itself. In this image, the Rover was coming out of the Victoria Crater, it saw this pile of rocks, stopped, looked around, changed its orientation, and drove around it. We didn't command that turn, it did. So we're doing more and more autonomous navigation now. This is how we came in with the uh, Curiosity Rover. We're coming in at like 13,000 miles an hour. There goes the cruise stage. From the top of the atmosphere to down in seven minutes. So we kind of call that seven minutes of terror because it's a communication time of 14 minutes. So when we say, oh, I'm on the surface, it's already been there for seven minutes. So it makes it scary. So we come in, we get a deceleration, about 11 or 12 Gs of deceleration. We do four minutes on the heat shield. This is the back where the hypersonic parachute's gonna come out. The problem, this is like a ton of rover. And trying to land a ton of material neatly on the surface is not trivial. So once we slow up to a reasonable speed, around the speed of sound, we, reasonable speed, we blow out a, a hypersonic parachute, which you'll see here. Once we're suspended, we're slowing down by the parachute, we blow the bolts and the heat shield falls out and there's the rover blowing in the wind. So there's nothing protecting the rover at this point. It's wearing a jet pack, we power it up and then we blow the bolts and we drop the whole thing. So now it's got a radar where it's in panic mode where it's trying to find out where the ground is. It's got the thrusters that are skewed. There's the radar, this yellow thing in the front where it's trying to figure out where it is and where it needs to go. And then, once we get close enough to the ground, we do the sky crane. The sky crane, and that's a camera by the way, that's Marty, so we're looking at the ground, seeing where we're going, making cool movies by the way. The sky crane, you'll see that we let the rover down from the descent stage on three cables. You'll notice there'll be four cables there. So, you've got three cables holding it, the fourth is power and commanding because the rover is driving the descent stage. We're going down about one to two miles an hour and we're trying to find out where the ground is. As soon as the wheels touch, the system has to throttle down because it's not descending nearly as fast. At that point, it commands it to cut the cables. There's no load that pops up and track crashes. Piece of cake. <laughs> yeah, it looks scary. The thing was that this thing was so popular and the United States and the world just love it that Congress actually gave us money for another one. So here is an actual photograph from the Curiosity rover. There's its power supply looking back on where it's coming from. What we're trying to do is study the rocks on Mars. And we're not just trying to see rocks on the surface because that tells you what it's made of, that's it. We want bedrock that's stratified because now we know composition, we know location, and we now have the chronology, the history of how this stuff evolves. Well, as I said, because Curiosity was such a success, Congress gave us money for a 2020 rover that's the exact same thing, but we're always pushing the technology. So if you think about it, back in 1997 where we had Pathfinder, which we were trying bouncing, landing on Mars, we had a little rover called Sojourner and Sojourner was so, such a hit to have mobility that every future lander was a rover. What we're trying on this one is we're gonna to try to bring a one to two kilogram helicopter. So now, rather than trying to avoid rocks and getting stuck, we're gonna to try to do these sorties where we go up you know, for a few minutes, look around, get the information, send it back to mom, and then park again, and then recharge the batteries. Because if it's a success, Maybe every future Mars lander is a helicopter mission. On to Saturn. What people don't realize about Saturn, Saturn's huge. Um, <laughs> no, really. If you bring Saturn to the Earth-Moon system and have this side of the ring touch the, touch the Earth, this side would touch the Moon. Whoa. So the next time you see the Moon at night, just picture that it's just this this ice field that goes all the way up to the moon. But it's only like 100 feet thick. So what we want to do is, is study the Saturn system. Uh, one of the weird things we've seen, because right now Cassini, which is a Saturn mission, it's been there since 2004, 
one of the moons, Enceladus, is this little moon. It's got geysers. Geysers are wet. That means it's got liquid water. So now you have to ask yourself how a billion miles away from the sun, we're 93 million miles away from the sun, how from a billion miles away from the, the sun do you have a, a small ice cube have liquid water? And if the liquid water was long standing, is there anything fun in, fun in it? You know, we've talked about missions where maybe you, you try to pass the moon and go through the plumes and collect what's coming up. I just want to find a tooth. That's all I want to find. <laughs> but this is one of the other really wild places where we're looking for life. Uh, just to give you in the news, we just went by Pluto. This is the first time we went by there. If later on you want to ask, hey, how come Pluto's not a planet? I'm more than happy to go into that. Let me first finish the talk. It's a tell, whoa. Anyway, this is what Pluto looked like from Hubble. This is what New Horizons looked like. And what kills me about this, and here's some more Pluto shots. If you had told me before we got there that you would have a tough time finding craters on Pluto, I would have told you you were crazy. Because craters, and the number of craters tells you about how old the surface is. If it doesn't have craters, it means it's a relatively new surface. If it's a new surface, how do you make it new? So we have no idea what's going on. We can see mountain peaks that are like, you know, this uh, is three kilometers. Uh, we know that the surface composition can't hold that, so it must be a water ice substrate with nitrogen and methane veneer over these peaks. Uh, Europa is one of the moons of Jupiter. This guy, that's Jupiter, Ganymede. What's wild about Europa, and we got hints from Voyager, but Gallo claimed it, Europa has a subterranean ocean. We think if you look at all the water on Europa, the volume is equal to twice the water that's on all the oceans on all the Earth. So now if you have standing water that's there for billions of years, and you got organics and you got energy, why isn't it alive? Um, so one of the things we're working on, and here's another new technology that you'll find really fun, we think you have these hydrothermal vents that are keeping this thing wet rather than solid, and you'll have convection cells, and the top of the, the moon, the ice, gets radiated with radiation from the Jupiter environment, and stuff may be raining in. So we think the best environment is right along underneath the ice. Okay. Um, we don't know how thick this ice field is. Some people think it's only a, you know, a few miles. Some people think it could be tens of miles thick. We don't know. But we do believe that right underneath the ice is the best way to do it. So I'm going to show you technology that we're working on. We still don't know how to get it a half a billion miles out here. We don't know how to get through the ice. We don't know how to get power to it. We don't know how to get commands out of it. But look at this technology. This is Brewy. We went up to Alaska with baby Brewy. We cut out an ice plug. That's little baby Brewy in the box. Brewy is buoyant robotic under ice uh, exploration. We drop it in. As it falls, we inflate a bladder, and the thing, come on, we have to control this from JPL, it's really pretty cool. It actually drives on the bottom of the ice. <laughs> <laughs> so this thing, um, we're just working on these technologies, you know, we still have a long ways to go, but you know, every journey starts with the first step. What we do is we instrument this thing to actually try driving around the bottom of the ice to really see what's going on. We did this with National Geographic, so you can see their logo there. But hey, uh, this is one of many technologies we're working on because two of the major areas, one are mobility systems, things that drive. The other is interferometers, and I can explain that later, but it takes a little more time than I have right now. Uh, what we'd like to do, and I'm bopping around the solar system, this is Saturn. Uh, there's Saturn. This is the moon Titan. Titan is really weird. You guys are sitting in one atmosphere of pressure. Titan is one and a half atmospheres of pressure. You guys are sucking in 78% nitrogen. That's like 98, 99% nitrogen. The big difference between where you are and this place is one, it's really, really cold, which just means the chemistry happens slower. 
and there's no oxygen, but the Earth didn't have oxygen when it made life 3.8-ish billion years ago. So we're trying to study it. We've got a mission around there right now. One of the future missions for the 2030th time frame is to have an orbiter that would have a boat that would float in these oceans, because we now know the Titan has liquids on its surface, and maybe a balloon with a gondola. Now, the really weird thing about this place, well, there's a lot of weird things. One, it's got liquid ethane, methane, rain. And the only way I would describe that is take a butane lighter and the liquid in there, just picture that, that rains in this place. So it snows ethane, it turns to rain, it then forms rivers, it forms lakes, it goes into oceans. What's a really heady thing from a visual point of view is, this has got the mass of the moon, and it's got an atmosphere one and a half times as thick as us, so when it rains on Titan, the raindrops fall slow. <laughs> Which would be such a weird experience to just try to figure, just like, you make it really kind of, kind of, kind of matrix thing. <laughs> um, next year, uh, our buddies at Goddard is doing OSIRIS-REx. We are actually trying to launch something from the Earth that's going to go to an asteroid that's actually going to grab some of that material because we want to see the building blocks of the solar system. So the Japanese have already done that. They returned a few grains. We're trying to do grams to kilograms of material back. This is one reason why asteroids are important, and you really can't see this. Holy cow. That's the sun. There's supposed to be orbits in here. You don't see it. Um, if every red dot you see in this picture is an Earth-crossing asteroid, well, there aren't any in this one. Green or outside of it. This is how many asteroids we knew about in 1800. This is what we knew about in 1900, 1950, and by the way, I need to do truth in advertising. You can't preserve distance and diameter on the same scale, so these asteroids are not the same size of Mars. I'm just trying to illustrate a point. So that's what we knew in 1950. 1990, 1999, 2015, we're over two, 681,000 objects in the asteroid belt. Uh, 12,430 are near-Earth objects, they come close. 1,570 of those are potentially hazardous objects. Now let me just describe what a potentially hazardous object is. In 19... Uh, God, must have been 1990, see the four or five, let's say five. A comet came too close to Jupiter, it's called shoemaker Levy 9, it was the ninth one that team found. The gravity pulled this thing apart to 23, 23 fragments. We weren't that creative naming it, it was the A fragment, the B fragment, only the W. The G fragment was the big piece, that was one mile across. Now I don't know if you think one mile across ice cube is big or small in the space business, but when that one mile across object hit Jupiter, we calculated that it released six million megatons of TNT. Now, I don't know about you guys, but even on this business, when I hear million and mega in the same sentence, <laughs> doesn't mean anything to me. So we were trying to come up with a good way of describing six million megatons of TNT. You can get that amount of energy if you take a small atomic bomb and you drop one every second. I have no idea why I'm looking at my watch, it's totally pointless. <laughs> drop one every second for 11 years. Oh. That's what a one mile across object does. So one of the jokes we use that we rip off from Larry Niven, the author, is the reason why the dinosaurs aren't alive today is because they didn't have a space program. <laughs> so we're trying to learn about these things. One way we're toying with doing this is when the space launch system comes online, which we're, we're looking at 2018 for the first launch of this, it won't be with any what we call wetware. You've got hardware, software, wetware. No wetware. We would launch it with the Orion spacecraft, the capsule on top. We want to go to an asteroid. And what we would do with the asteroid is we would land on it and grab a boulder and then we pick up the boulder and leave with it, and then we put the boulder in orbit around the moon, so the moon will have a moon. <laughs> We've calculated that uh, this rock that we put in this special orbit should be uh, stable for about 250 years, 
A lot of people think it's over 20,000 years, but we haven't done the math to go that far out. But once you have an asteroid in orbit around the moon, you could go there anytime you want. And what the boys and girls down at the Johnson Space Center, where they do the human exploration, what they'd like to do is, you have the, uh, this is the asteroid redirect mission with the asteroid. They'd love to put another habitat module on the end of this, because when Orion docks with this, they can spend two days exploring that rock in the orbit around the moon. If you put a habitat module here with another solar rays, you can be there for a month and you're inadvertently making a lunar orbiting outpost. So we'll see which way things go. Uh, I'm not sure if you can be able to see this. To me, this is the most important photo Hubble ever took. It's old, but I figured you guys are rookies, so I would just do it. The director of the Hubble Space Telescope put Hubble in the smallest field of view. Basically, it's about the, a grain of sand held at arm's distance. Pointed it to the darkest part of the sky and he sat there for 10 days straight. He got this picture. There's over 3,000 dots in this picture. Now, the lighting may be bad. I don't know if you can see it from the back, but where I have one here, there's an object. It's called a diffraction pattern, but it looks like it's got this crosshairs on it. Of the 3,000 dots, only five of them have crosshairs. One, two, three, four, five. What you're looking at, well, those five objects are five of the 200 billion suns in the Milky Way galaxy. Everything else, you're looking past the Milky Way galaxy at other galaxies of hundreds of billions of suns. Do you have any idea how insignificant we are? It's nuts, absolutely nuts. Now, where we are today in terms of looking for planets, the way this business works is if you find a planet, it's a detection. If you go, hey, he's right, it's a confirmation. So we have, we're coming in on 6,000 planets that we actually detected. Of those, over 300 of them are Earth size, which means they've got a surface, which we think you need for life. And of those, 13 are actually in the habitable zone. We call it the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold where you can have liquid water on the surface. So we're trying to find the, well, Terra, it's called uh, the Terra Nova's New Earth. But here's a technique we're working on. Here's a telescope. This is called a star shade. This thing can be 20, 30 feet across, depending on the size. And what you do is you send that 10, 20, 30,000 miles out and you block the star so the light gets dimmed by the star shape so you can visibly see planets around other worlds. Because right now the way we do it is just with uh, secondary effects. You're watching stars wobble, you're watching spectral lines change, you're looking at light dim. We want to do these. We want to find the Terra Nova, the new stars, because we really want to see if we're alone. But why do we do this? We do this for three reasons. One is just because we're curious, exploring our place in the universe. Next, what we do is we take that information we learn and we reapply it to the Earth. So if we have laws on how atmospheres work, and then we go to Neptune, we find out it doesn't work. We modify the equations so they work at both Earth and Neptune, and now we take that modified equation back to the Earth to better understand what Earth is doing. And then you have what I like to refer to as technology droppings. I mean, NASA was not created to start a weather satellite business, a communication satellite business, a GPS satellite business, an Earth remote satellite, Earth remote sensing satellite business. Those are just the ones that have gone commercial. We always thought retail processing would be next, but it looks like uh, tourism is really coming up fast on the outside. I'm going to end with a series of photos. On the left, that's Earth as seen from Earth orbit, lower orbit. The middle. That's Apollo 8, that's the Earth is seen from the moon, it's called Earthrise. This is a picture taken by the Mars Exploration rovers, and I don't know if you can see it, we really punched up the brightness. There's a dot in there. That's Earth as seen from the surface of Mars. So think about it, anything that ever did happen, or I can't say ever will happen, but anything that ever happened in the past and anybody ever knew was always there. This is a picture taken by Cassini of Saturn where the sun is directly in front of Saturn, so you're just seeing the rings glow in forward scattered light. I'm gonna draw another circle. We punch that up too. 
in that circle, that's the Earth as seen from a billion miles out. I'm going to end with a quote by one of my heroes, Konstantin Edvardovich Tsiolkovsky. The Earth is the cradle of the mind, but one cannot live in the cradle forever. Thank you. Great job, Kenny. Nailed it. That was really exciting. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing all of that. It was just really cool to see uh, all the various missions that have been going on. And all this. I know, I'm sure there's so much more. Um, but thank you so much for, for sharing your passion and some of the really cool things in, uh, in, our, in our galaxy. Uh, solar system and also galaxy at large. So right now we're going to open up to uh, Q&A. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of really cool questions. Um, how much time do we have approximately for that? Probably about 10. Like, if you want to extend it, maybe like to 50, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll also stay here afterwards. <laughs> yeah, so if you, guys, if you guys have questions that are not reached, you know, just ask them offline. But again, save it for Q&A um, and limit commentary, please. In the back. Oh, wait. Are you trying to get the microphone back there? or? Yeah. Hold it. I can yell. Well, yeah, but it's trying to record it to be on this system, so. <laughs> um, unbelievable presentation. Quick question. So for the helicopter on the rover, how do you simulate um, atmospheric conditions so that you can test a prototype? Obviously, Mars is a very different atmosphere than we do on Earth. It's relatively easy because we can take vacuum chambers and then just pump them down to seven thousandths of an atmosphere cool it down, and then we try to see what it takes to lift a couple kilogram object. And the bottom line is you need relatively high RPMs and relatively high uh, area for the props because there's not much to push off. But we've demonstrated that we actually can lift off in a Martian type environment. I mean, the other thing that's also weird about Mars, you could stand on the equator of Mars bare feet. Your feet would be at around 40 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Your knees would be at freezing, your waist might be at minus 50, your head might be at minus 100. So safety tip, if you find yourself on Mars, <laughs> lay down and roll. <laughs> um, one of the questions I've got is, there's obviously a lot of communications to and from uh, JPL to the rover. What about the cyber security in terms of ensuring the uh, safety of that? Because I'm sure every kid in the country or around the world is trying to hack and take control of it. Um, that is true. We're finding people are trying to hack into the lab all the time. The problem is, is they don't have the code and the files to actually get something. I mean, they can't hack into the DSN and they don't have their own DSN to do that. They have to hack into JPL to do that. So we worry about cybersecurity here uh, at the lab. I will tell you that people are getting more and more concerned about lower orbiting stuff because that's being... Uh, let's just say it could be more accessible. We're not worried about deep space yet, but as the technology improves, you know, all I have to do is, is hack in anywhere along that command path from generating the ideas to what you radiate. But it is a concern. Hi, uh, I'm Singing Steve. I was here the other hey, day. Hey, Singing Steve. How you doing? Um, I, and there was another uh, presentation uh, in another meetup about the Mars rover. And Mars is the red planet. Yep. But they found every hole that they drilled was gray. Why? Well, the red is really from an iron oxide. So you're looking at the rust. Uh, there's also weathering, and you also get the stuff that gets blown around all over the place. So the, the planet gets to a uniform red color. When you go subsurface, that stuff hasn't weathered, and you obviously have those oxides. So it, it'll be a slightly different material. So it's just a thin layer of it, Think of it as a veneer. You know, one of the reasons why we put drills like the drill on the rovers are called RAT for the rock abrasion tool. Everything's an acronym. Um, we found that everything has this veneer on it that you have to grind through. Otherwise, if you just microscopically look at it, it all looks like the same stuff. So everything has that red coating, and it really is just the oxides. Uh, there you go. Hi, Jack Fritz. I'm a US patent lawyer. Um, Elon Musk said something fun recently, as always. Uh, he said, if you wanted to make Mars habitable within our lifetimes, you just nuke the poles. 
Uh, is that going to work? Is that we? <laughs> um, we're not even a. You know, we stopped bringing nuclear reactors to space, and even the stuff that's not nuclear, the uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generators, the stuff that just decays plutonium that we convert to heat, we have a problem to launch. So bombing a planet is not that easy to do just legally. But let's just talk about the physics and logistics. If you want Mars to become more habitable, you have to increase the atmospheric pressure. You want to go from 7,000 of an atmosphere to a close to an atmosphere pressure. You can do that a number of ways. One way is to try to tilt the spin axis so the poles receive more light, to melt more of the poles, to melt more gases, to actually try to get more things melting to get a, a greenhouse effect going. I don't know how you tilt a planet. Um, if you're going to try to nuke a pole, that seems relatively hard because even though nukes are pretty big and scary, we're talking about doing things on a planetary scale. So I wouldn't use nukes even if I was allowed to do that. Depending on how you wanted to terraform a place, there's one of two ways you do it. You do it slowly, you do it like how people do uh, agriculture on the desert, where they just reclaim certain areas at a time so you can see those round circles. So maybe you start putting domes and you start connecting domes to make small towns and then making cities. Or what you do is you try to get more gas up there and you try to do it all at once. That's gonna take many generations with our current technology. One of the things that people are looking at, can you actually do genetic engineering on microbes to get them to be able to live in that kind of dry environment and just go <sighs> And as it gives out more stuff, you try to heat up the place. They're both well past our current capabilities and will be for a while. Yeah. Hi. Um, What's the latest thinking on those bright spots in the most recent picture? Uh, I assume you're talking about the bright spots that the Dawn spacecraft has seen around Ceres, which is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. We don't know yet. Um, we've been taking bets at the laboratory. Uh, I think the number one answer, most people think they're, they're ices, but you have to ask yourself, how do you get ices in those patterns? You could kind of understand peaks. You can't quite understand those little pieces, those flecks in the basin of those craters. Some people think it's evaporates from salts. Um, well, I've heard everything from plumes to uh, life. I mean, we don't know what it is. What you really want to do is you want to be able to get low enough so that your spectrometer that takes composition information can get enough of a signal to try to figure out what it is. Most people think it's some sort of ice. That, that's our bet. But the wonderful thing about this business is we're always proved wrong, and that's great. So there's a lot of job security here. <laughs> Question here. They're already taking applications for people to go to Mars. Yeah. What, uh, what is your time frame? Do you think well, we'll be able to, to actually send somebody over there? OK. In terms of the time frame, the analogy, I love looking at the history for indications for the future. Uh, during the 1960s, Werner von Braun was asked, what would it take to send people to the moon? And he simply said, the will to do so. This is just a fun function, function of funding. You know, what we're trying to do is, you know, the lab just came up with an approach that if you shut down space station in 2024-ish time frame, which is the current time frame, and I don't know what you do with space station after 2024, but you took that funding level and you just put that into a human exploration of Mars, uh, we could send humans to Phobos, one of the two moons of Mars, by 2031, and we can get humans on the surface by 2035. But you gotta ask yourself a couple questions. You know, there are four phases of human exploration, of, of, of exploration. There's swing bys to do the basics, how big is it, what is it made of, how many moons. There's orbiters for temporal studies to see how things evolve as time, so you're not doing composition atmosphere, you're doing weather. Three is your landers and sample returns, four is human exploration, and I personally like to say that you only do four when it's economically viable. So there was no business model for keep going back to the moon, that's why people haven't gone back to the moon. There's, it's just a, a sink of money. So if you look about humans going to Mars, Apollo was about three, three and a half days to the moon. If you're gonna go to Mars, you're talking about a home and transfer is 11 months. Say with magic, you can figure out, you can do it in six months one way. So say you can be on a service for a few months and another six months back, you're talking about a year and a half. That's 
that's quite the capability. So you have to ask yourself, why would you do it? You know, when you're developing this capability, if you kill somebody, that would stop the whole program. Say you didn't, say you started with design of six, budget cutbacks made a design of four. You do this, you plant your flag, you're there six months, three months. How many times would we do that? Once? Twice? We're not ready to go there with humans. I'd much rather do it robotically because we cover much more real estate and do a much better job. I would like to have people going back to the moon and I can come up with both scientific and economic reasons for sending humans to the moon. Scientific, the oldest rocks we have on the earth are 3.8 billion years old. You look at those old rocks, you can see indications of life in it. Well, when you go to Antarctica, you can find meteorites from the moon and from Mars down in Antarctica, and when you look at it, you can see that there are gases trapped in it, so you can see what the gases were on Mars. Well, are there any meteorites from the Earth sitting on the moon that are older than 3.8 billion years? Could they actually have trapped gases of what the Earth's atmosphere was like before it got polluted with life forms? So there's a good scientific one, and for an economics one, can, and this is just a fantasy, can you picture moving all heavy industry from the Earth to the moon and leaving Earth as a biosphere? <laughs> so I mean, there, there are definitely reasons out there, but you know, humans to Mars, that's a huge investment for I'm not sure what kind of gain other than to name some high schools and plant a flag. Next, yeah. Uh, thanks for your presentation, pretty cool. Uh, I'd like to ask a question, and sure. the people has already asked many times, and I'd like to hear your opinions and perspectives. Yeah. So, uh, is any life in, in other planets in the universe, things considered about the lifetime of the universe, and also enormous planets in the universe? And if there is, and uh, why we, we, we can find it, and also if there is in other uh, life in other planets, it's very possible to have the same like the uh, technological modernizations as what we are. So either they have much higher uh, like the modernizations technology, they so may also can find us. Why they cannot find us and why we cannot find them? Do you have a day and a half? <laughs> okay. Uh, one, my own personal belief, I have a tough time believing this is the best nature can do in terms of <laughs> 200 to 400 million signs of another galaxy. Okay. <laughs> So I believe there's life out there, okay? And I can come up with a great explanation for why I believe that, but I, I believe there's life out there. Uh, I'm not gonna do this in any particular order, but let's see if we can handle this. Um, let's see, uh, there's a great quote, by the way, by Arthur C. Clarke that he goes, sometimes I think we're alone in the universe, sometimes I think we're not. Both answers are terrifying. <laughs> okay. Now, in terms of life, I think it'll be a lot like us, because, you know, take science fiction. They're always talking about, you know, silicon-based life, because it's right under carbon with a periodic table. Well, yeah, I mean, sure it is. But if star stars, as they go through nuclear fusion, go through the synthesis, they go from hydrogen to helium, all the way down the line, stars make a whole lot more carbon than silicon. So why would life choose something that's rarer when there's so much more carbon available. So I would expect life forms to be carbon-based carbon, carbon based like us. Look at eyeballs on this planet. Eyeballs are formed three different ways. You've got mammalian eyeballs, you got insect eyeballs with the compound eyeballs, and then you got the snail eyeballs on the, on the little stalks. But you see, they only make two, and they're tuned to yellow light. So I would tell you that's, that making eyeballs is tough to do, so you only make as many as you need, no more, um, so that's two, redundancy and depth of field. And then you'll be sensitive to the color of the star that you evolved around. So if I'm around a blue star, I'd expect eyes to be shifted to the shorter wavelengths. So there's a lot of analogies that I would make, but let's face it, there's a big difference between an amoeba, a sea cucumber, a cow, and a tree. So how you actually put those pieces together, it's gonna be basically evolving what's going on in that system. Look at the planet they just found with Kepler, 452b. It's about the same size as Earth. Its year is 388 days. It's about 60% larger. And it's been around an extra billion years. Ooh, if I had an extra billion years to evolve stuff. 
And if you're six percent larger, it means you have more mass, which means you have a stronger gravitational field. So does that mean giants, giants like sequoias are about this tall? Because with a stronger gravity field, they can't capillary suck up the water that high. So I think the life is out there, but it's a very difficult thing to find. Uh, one approach is to look for radio emissions, but I think that's kind of a weak approach because you're looking for life forms that are evolved as we are out there. So I think that's a narrow window because we're not going to be on radio waves long. You know, we started with Marconi and Tesla in the early 1900s. We're now going to optical communications, so we'll go radio dark in the next 50, 100 years. So the way that JPL is talking about doing it is we want to look for spectral signatures of things that are biomarkers. So when you drive home tonight and you look at street lights, street lights come in different colors. You know, white is a mercury vapor, yellow is sodium vapor, whitish pink is high pressure sodium. So just by looking at color and splitting up, I can say a temperature pressure composition. Well, if you do a spectroscopic composition of the earth, you'll find ozone, O3. Ozone shouldn't be here. The chemistry and physics says we shouldn't have ozone. The only reason why we have ozone is because things are going and it's those are, those are biomarkers that are modifying the atmosphere with metabolic byproducts. So I think the approach is to look for metabolic byproducts, but just to try to end this thing, um, my Voyager spacecraft is traveling about a million miles a day, roughly. And a million miles a day to go to the nearest star of the 200 to 400 billion suns, and we're not going in that direction and stars move, but if they didn't and we were, at a million miles per per day, it would take over 70,000 years to get to the first star. This is not a trivial problem for finding what's going on in these other worlds, and we have to come up with techniques to do that. Uh, yeah, okay, and I'll stay here for other questions, so. Well, my question is about uh, the future of human exploration. Well, humans may well go to Mars or another planet, back in Star Trek. But my concern is, would the self that sustain us inside our body, because even though we go there, we're not the only one going there, we have a bacteria. Is there any process of research going on that make sure that our bacteria can survive wherever we go? Um, we do have a lot of stuff living, living in us. Matter of fact, if you want to get depressed, and, and, and galaxies work the same way, which is pretty funny. Well, I should say planets work the same way. If I take all the cells that make up me, and I put them on a, on a balance beam. And then on the other side of the balance beam, I take all this bacteria and stuff, the microorganisms that are living on me and in me, and put it on the other side. That side weighs more. So we are condos for bacteria. That's the first thing. Well said. <laughs> it's depressing, but it, I just call it the way it is. Um, so if we make conditions that are compatible with human behavior, it's compatible for everything else living with us. So what you really need to do is what we call terraforming a place. So we don't see if we can try to get bacteria that can live in a Mars environment. We make a Mars environment that both myself and all the guys living on me can live in. So um, I think that's so far downrange because you can't live in that environment and we're not even, you know, we're good 15, 20 years away from even going there, even with just the first cruise. We're going to bring our environment with us to keep it all us and our bacteria all happy in, in one big, one big soup. Okay, I'm going to hang out here, but oh, one last, last question. One last, last question. Without this going to be a last, 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 last question. Without <laughs> ending, on a, ending on a downer, you showed a slide with all the near Earth uh, asteroids and all that. Yeah. Is there anything that could be done if it is uh, detected one that that looks like you know it could potentially hit Earth? And you mentioned you know how damaging even a, a one mile. Diameter. Yeah, it gets really bad in a hurry. Um, <laughs> it's that one of MB squared thing, that V squared really hurts. Um, one of the things we're doing is we're looking at different techniques for deflecting asteroids. So a lot of these things really are key in terms of how soon, well, how far away before impact do you find it and how big it is. And, you know, we've talked about ideas of changing the albedo, the reflected surface material, so putting light stuff on one side so that solar pressure can inflect these things. One of the things we're doing that's kind of fun is called a gravitational tractor. And we're gonna do that with the asteroid redirect mission that's gonna pull that boulder off and bring it to the moon. A gravitational tractor assumes that if you have an asteroid, if you're mass enough and you're next to it, 
the mutual gravitational pull between the two will pull it both into to each other. If I don't let myself move because I keep using the thrusters, it means the asteroid should follow me. <laughs> so what we're going to do is after we pick the rock off the surface, we're going to stay about a week around this asteroid and see if we actually can measure a slight deflection in this asteroid due to the mass of the spacecraft. So you're not tying it, you don't, you're not putting a rocket on the surface, you just gravitationally tug it. So that's called a gravitational tug and we're going to try that during the arm mission because we recognize that one of these things can give you a really bad day. Um, so we are looking at techniques to try to flex it. But it's all about, you know, if I have two, three years in advance, maybe I can do something if it's small. If it's, you know, two months away, get a good seat. <laughs> Thank you. Great <laughs> uh, <laughs> answer. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing.